Our next speaker is Cook County Board President. She has served in that position for nearly four years. Prior to that, our guest today served as alderman of the fourth ward and has been a dedicated community leader for over two decades. She earned her bachelor's degree and her master's degree from the University of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle. Madam President. All right, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm particularly grateful to Chairman Daly and Commissioners Fritchie, Moore, and Murphy for joining us today, and for all of my staff. Um, I'm not going to try to catch everybody's name because I'll miss somebody and hurt feelings, uh, <clears throat> but Kim Fox and Tasha Green and all of our, our staff, would you please stand so I can thank you for your good work? I should acknowledge uh, Arnold Randall, who's superintendent of the Forest Preserve District, which I'm also the president of, and Jay Shannon, who's uh, acting CEO of our healthcare system as well. Thank you all. So I'm glad and maybe a little surprised to see so many people here during the World Cup. <laughs> I'll try to be as brief as possible so you can see the end of the game. I want to thank the City Club for inviting me here today. I'm a longtime supporter of the club. I often say that as a leader, it's not enough to make the right decisions. You have to explain your actions to the widest audience possible, engage people, and hopefully secure their support. As the longest running forum to discuss civic issues in Chicago, the City Club has provided that opportunity for leaders across sectors and industries. <clears throat> now, I'm normally not in the habit of throwing people I like under the bus, but Paul Green confessed earlier today that he ginned up the media by saying that I'd be making a big announcement today. So I'm here today to announce the county's fiscal year 2015. <laughs> preliminary budget forecast. <laughs> I want to thank our budget director, Andrea Gibson, and her deputy, Shelley Riedel, and the whole budget team for their good work. First, I should explain what that actually means. Four years ago, when I was elected president, the county had no budget process. Now that may sound like an exaggeration or hyperbole, but it's the truth. We walked in the door, there was a half a billion dollar deficit with no budget plan to solve it. And because of the county's unique fiscal calendar, our year begins December 1, it was already the first quarter of the fiscal year. Some of you have probably heard me tell that story. But it's important because it shows why, while it's still only June, the county's budget process is already officially underway. In fact, it's now a requirement by executive order. After passing our first budget, I called for a formalized budget process that begins by identifying and publishing a preliminary forecast prior to June 30th. The purpose of this financial snapshot is to allow us time to address challenges strategically and collaboratively before the end of the county fiscal year on November 30th. Now, after passing four budgets, we've solved for over 1.2 billion in deficits while returning 1.1 billion to our taxpayers by rolling back the sales tax increased under Todd Stroger. We've changed the way we work to find solutions. Today, we're projecting a budget deficit of 169 million for fiscal year 2015. It sounds terrible, but it's 300 million less than the deficit we faced when we walked in the door four years ago. <laughs> the 
There are two key components of that forecast, a decrease in economically dependent revenue sources and an increase in personnel-related expenditures. expenditures. First, let's talk about revenue. We've seen decreases, unfortunately, or slower than expected growth in revenue sources that depend on the economy, namely the revenue generated by the sales tax and the sale or transfer of property. This is thought to be largely attributed to our brutal winter. When the average temperature is 19 degrees and 65 inches of snowfall, it's not exactly surprising that people were less inclined to shop or buy real estate. The slowed growth in the sales tax is in addition to the rollback that went into full effect January of 2013. Having the highest sales taxes in the country was detrimental to our working families and detrimental to our businesses. I remain as committed to the rollback today as I was when I took office, because it was the right thing to do. But that doesn't mean it was easy, and it meant losing a valuable source of revenue in tough economic times. At the same time, we're committed to increasing and improving our enforcement efforts around other revenue initiatives, for example, the tobacco tax. We've added additional inspectors within the Department of Revenue. As a result, we've nearly tripled the number of cigarette tax inspections and doubled the number of confiscations of unstamped cigarettes. As part of our city-county collaboration, we're also partnering with the city of Chicago to increase enforcement efforts. Both governments collect cigarette taxes. Now both the city and county inspectors are issuing citations on each other's behalf resulting in 14 million more in revenue for the county alone. We created a website, and now we will be rolling out a phone app allowing residents to report tips and receive potential rewards. We've also taken significant steps to increase compliance. We've modernized and improved our enforcement processes, completely eliminating paper citations. As a result, we now have access to real-time data, including previous violators, to produce and send reports to administrative hearings. Next year, we look to bring in more than $130 million in cigarette tax revenues alone. The National Association of Counties awarded our Department of Revenue the 2014 Achievement Award for their tobacco tax enforcement and compliance efforts. Because of their good work, we're becoming a national model for best practices in this area. Enforcement actions create a level playing field for compliant businesses. The efforts we are now undertaking protect legitimate and honest businesses. Zara Ali, our revenue director, is here today, and she and her staff deserve kudos. I also challenge key departments in my administration and other elected officials to apply for additional grants. Historically, grant funding has not been a priority for the county. So let me tell you a little story. I walked in the door and I said, okay, in the city, we were always looking for state and federal grants. How are we doing? And I was told, basically, that the county didn't really apply for a lot of state and federal money. And I asked why. And I was told basically, well, you know, if you apply for those federal and state grants, they audit you. And you have to tell them how you spent the money, who you hired. So basically, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for applying those grants because you had to be accountable. Needless to say, we, uh, we decided to go in a different direction under my administration. For the 2014 budget, the county increased grant awards from $134 million to $162 million. In our Bureau of Economic Development, uh, an effort was led to bring together 20 organizations, municipalities, and counties to form the Chicago Metal Metro Consortium. Just last month, we were designated by the federal government as one of the nation's 12 manufacturing communities and are now eligible for a pool of $1.3 billion in federal funding. Current projections for 2015 show that we will surpass 190 million in grants, a good beginning. Now let's shift gears to expenditures. Roughly 80% of the county budget is personnel. 
much of the projected increase is a natural result of supporting that employee population. For example, one of the biggest factors is funding step increases. The periodic increases in employee salary required by our collective bargaining agreements. Most county employees are, are entitled to step increases. Only some of our senior staff, the folks who are with us here today, about 4% of our workers are ineligible and have not received raises for five years. Over the last four years, we've made some strategic structural changes to make sure that those costs are appropriate. Today we have a smaller, stronger government than we did four years ago. We've reduced the number of budget, budgeted positions by almost 2,000. And in fiscal year 2014, the county workforce was 8% lower than it was when we walked in the door. We implemented the county's first performance management effort to hold employees more accountable. As county board president, I have two major responsibilities, public health and public safety. And some of our biggest personnel challenges are in the public safety arena. Cook County has the largest unified court system and the largest single site jail in the country. Not surprisingly, the jail is an incredibly expensive enterprise. Every year, taxpayers pay over $385 million, almost $400 million, to operate our jail and our juvenile temporary detention center. Approximately $321 million of that cost is personnel. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I've talked a lot about our over-reliance on pretrial detention. Contrary to most people's assumptions, the jail is not primarily a place where we lock up violent criminals. The jail is not primarily a place where people wait to go to prison. In fact, only 10% of the people in our jail are serving a sentence, one in 10. Instead, it's a place where thousands of people are awaiting their day in court. And remember, the foundation of our justice system is that people are innocent until proven guilty. Many, if not most, of those who are awaiting trial in our jail are there because they can't afford their bail. Furthermore, 70% of those who are awaiting trial are currently charged with nonviolent offenses. This is not only bad for the individuals in our jail and the communities they come from, it's terrible physical policy. More importantly, we're not doing the best we can to protect public safety. We're spending too much of our scarce resources on those accused of nonviolent offenses. And this takes away from the resources that could be better spent on those charged with violent crimes. I want every community in the county to be safe. And we can only do that by freeing up the resources that are consumed by detaining so many accused of nonviolent offenses. We know the best way to reduce the cost of the jail is to bring down the jail population. This was my priority when I came into office, and it continues to be my priority. Last year, the population at the jail consistently hovered around 10,000 individuals. Now, I'm proud to say, we're down to roughly 8,700, and we're working diligently to sustain that downward trend. One important reason we've seen this decline is the increased scrutiny by the Illinois Supreme Court. And I want to thank, in particular, Ann Burke, and our thoughts are with the Burke family today, as Ed undergoes surgery. I want to thank the Supreme Court, and in particular, Ann Burke, for her willingness to give us a hand here. I wrote to the court in September of last year and asked for their help in making our court system more fair and more efficient. The Supreme Court, including all seven justices, has now met with me and all of the criminal justice stakeholders, the state's attorney, the public defender, the sheriff, the clerk of the court, the chief judge, and assigned two retired judges to work with us on an ongoing basis. And now that we're seeing declines in the jail jail population, it's our responsibility to make sure that there's the same downward trend in staffing levels and overtime. This happens when we close down tiers of the jail, eliminating the cost of maintaining and staffing them. For every jail tier we close, we see over half a million dollars in savings every year. This year, in partnership with the Sheriff's Office, we'll begin demolition and consolidation of the jail campus. We will be demolishing two administrative buildings and consolidating staff, 
and plans are currently underway to demolish three housing divisions, saving an estimated 87 million over the next 10 years, according to a comprehensive study by U.S. Equities. Yet the expense of the jail is not simply a matter of bricks and mortar. Detaining so many people for so long has terrible social costs. Our current rate of pretrial detention is devastating our communities. Studies have shown that once a person enters the jail, they're more likely to be rearrested and returned to jail, regardless of the offense. In fact, 50% of the people released from jail will return to jail within three years. Furthermore, our detainees are coming disproportionately from a handful of zip codes, which are primarily black and brown communities, which is why I say, always and everywhere, that the jail is at the intersection of racism and poverty in this country. My bitter joke is that 86% of the people in our jail are black and brown, and if you looked at our jail population, you would think that there were no white people who lived in Cook County. And it's even more um, disturbing for our juvenile uh, detention center where more than 90% of the kids are black and brown. My office meets regularly with local service providers to work to break down the barriers to successful reentry for residents returning from prison and jail. I'm sure you can guess what those factors are that make it difficult for those exiting jail to successfully reintegrate into our communities. Employment, housing, health care, and education. As a result of community input, we've developed violence prevention and recidivism reduction grants to try to keep people from reentering jail and to better support those who are exiting our jail. We distributed nearly $2 million in grant funding to community organizations last year, and we're looking to increase that funding moving forward. We've doubled the amount we invest in communities for recidivism reduction. In addition to providing grants, we're also increasing our efforts to solicit grant funding. For example, our Justice Advisory Council received half a, a half a million dollar grant from the MacArthur Foundation to improve bond court and reduce reliance on pretrial detention. Our efforts to, re to reduce over-reliance on pretrial detention will enable us to reallocate these funds to support critical education, mentoring, job tra training, placement, and treatment programs in communities throughout Cook County. We're also working to ensure that those who leave our jail have access to quality health services, including mental health and substance abuse treatment. Around 83% of those arrested in the city for whatever offense test positive for drugs, a figure that's roughly the same since the Office of National Drug Control, Pol Control Policy began issuing such reports in 2000. Roughly 30% of the people in our jail, a little less than one in three, suffers from mental illness. These are examples of the intersection of criminal justice and public health. I've spoken a great deal about the transformation of our healthcare system. Without question, the Affordable Care Act is one of the most important pieces of legislation in decades. In November of 2012, we received permission from the federal government to begin to early enroll patients who would be eligible for Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act at the beginning of this year. Medicare, remember, services those 65 and older, and Medicaid those 19 to 64. Our Medicaid expansion program is called County Care, it allows us to maintain our mission of providing care to people who need it and upholding our commitment to the taxpayers of Cook County to streamline the costs of health care. Overall, we are keeping our promise to our patients to firmly protect the quality and sustainability of our health care services. A transformation of this size and scope is challenging. And as one of the first entities to implement the Affordable Care Act, we knew this would be a huge undertaking and that it would require a lot of learning as we went along. This only underscores the importance of a disciplined budget process, which allows us not only to identify opportunities and challenges of the next budget cycle, but to measure our progress against our current budget. Today we are projecting that we will end the year with an $86 million deficit if we take no further action. 67 million of which is tied to our health care system. Clearly, we cannot afford such a deficit, and we will be working with all county stakeholders, particularly our health care system, to reduce it. One of the major contributors to this shortfall is the federal government. 
and its reimbursements for our county care members. Historically, the county was providing $500 million, that's half a billion dollars a year, in uncompensated care. Today, when we began to implement the 1115, or rather, when we began to implement the 1115 waiver in November of 2012, we established the reimbursement rate known as the per member per month amount. In 2013, as part of our county care program, we were reimbursed half this amount, and the county covered the remaining costs. In 2014 and 2015, thank God, we will receive the full reimbursement. However, an audit of our fiscal year 2013 actual expenses shows there was a, that, that they were a little lower than the initial uh, estimate. Therefore, we, we have to anticipate paying back the federal government $33.5 million later this year. This process of financial review continues as we discuss an appropriate rate moving forward with the federal government. That also means we'll have to adjust our initial revenue projections by roughly $30 million. We will continue to work with the healthcare system to control expenditures and ensure that we manage patient care, improve healthcare outcomes, and control costs all at the same time. Despite these challenges, we've seen tremendous success. To date, we are one of the largest Medicaid expansion programs in the United States. We have successfully approved over 114,000 applications for county care, including over 4,700 applicants who have come through the jail. We have built a, a health care network focused on preventive care, primary care, located in communities throughout the county. On July 1st, we enter the next phase of our transformation. Our county care program becomes a managed care community network, or MCCN. Under the Medicaid Affordable Care Act expansion, members had to fall between the ages of 19 and 64, have no dependents with living, within them, living with them, and be within 138% of the federal poverty level. By becoming a managed care community network, the county care program can expand our eligible population to include families, children, seniors, and persons with disabilities. But this second phase isn't just about expanding the patient population, it's about improving the patient experience and effectively managing care. Now, instead of being reactive, we are focusing on sustaining a culture of customer service. This includes recruiting a new director of patient experience who will be charged with developing the strategies and processes for ensuring we are effective effectively communicating with and listening to our patients and holding our managers accountable. These are necessary measures to ensure that we are moving forward the provider of choice for our residents rather than the provider of last resort. And that's a big transition. Now the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, and arguably the elephant in the room, pension reform. While there is not a financial impact in 2015, pension reform is critical to protecting the retirement security of our workers, the county's bond rating, and the interests of our taxpayers. That's why we've been working for the last two years with our unions and other stakeholders to eliminate the $6.5 billion in unfunded pension fund debt. Our plan is focused more on our current workforce rather than our retirees, at the request of our workers, I might add, and includes a number of reforms to our pension system. We're asking our county employees to work longer, because we all live longer, and to accrue benefits more slowly. In exchange, the pension fund, which is currently projected to be insolvent in 20 to 25 years, will provide benefits to our workers well into the future. Additionally, we included an automatic adjustment mechanism so Cook County taxpayers do not have to shoulder all the risk if market returns don't follow expected trends. And with the support of two-thirds of our unions, as well as the Chamber of Commerce and the Civic Federation, I went to Springfield in May to introduce our bill, and we secured passage by a supermajority in the Senate. I'm grateful to the legislators who worked with us and will continue to work with members of the House of Representatives to move our proposal forward. I want to thank our Chief Financial Officer, Ivan Samstein, and his team, in particular Joe Clary, for their good work with us down in Springfield. I'm going to conclude with one of my favorite statements. Democracy is the best and the most fragile form of government on Earth for the same reason. It depends on an active, engaged citizenry. 
When I was a teacher, this is what I would tell my students all the time. Now that I'm Cook County Board President, I say it just about everywhere I go, because it needs to be said. Resident need, residents need to know that as an elected official, I need to hear from them. We're working hard to make county government more transparent, accountable, and accessible. As part of our budget process, I've required a public hearing on the preliminary forecast so that I can hear directly the questions, concerns, and priorities of our residents. This year, we'll hold our hearing on July 16th at 6 p.m. at the Cook County Building. If you don't want to spend your Wednesday evening with us, you can weigh in on our website, cookcountyil.gov, or on Twitter using the hashtag CCBudget2015. It's my responsibility not only to be forthcoming, but to be responsive. It's your responsibility not only to take an interest, but to play an active role. And so will that, with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks and take your questions. But fair warning, I'm a teacher, so if no one raises their hand, I will start calling on the people I know. Thank you. All right, and since I, since I threw Paul under the bus, I'll give him a chance to ask the first question. Uh, Madam President, uh, obviously you must have heard that rumor. I, of all people, would, would I hype up anything like this? Uh, you know, especially since I have so many of my former students in this room. Timmy, raise your hand. Brian, where are you? Billy Filan, are you here too? You know, I've done my best to, to run this uh, state. Anyway, I don't have any questions. We have so many important people here. Let's get right to it. John Gates, soon to be unemployed. How do you f <laughs> and happy about it? How do you feel about <laughs> broadening? Broadening, very good. You're not going to get a job as a penman. The sales tax to include services, which could which could leave you additional room to reduce the rate. I know that this is uh, increasing the sales tax to services is something that President uh, John Cullerton and the Senate has supported for a very long period of time. Um, it's something I always thought was a good idea, frankly. Uh, it doesn't make sense that we, that we apply the sales tax to goods and not services, given the direction our economy has gone in the last several decades. Um, so I await action in Springfield. This is where action would be uh, required. Uh, and I just want to thank John Gates for his effort on behalf of RTA and other taxing bodies in Cook County to ensure that corporations within our bounds did not use um, storefronts in other counties with, with lower sales taxes to avoid Cook County sales taxes. Thank you, John. Madam President, we have uh, Linda Foreman. Where are you, Linda? Right here. Oh, that's right. You gave me the question. What effect, oh, the same kind of question, what effect is the county making to encourage the federal government to allow internet sales tax collections for state and local governments? Uh, our own Senator Dick Durbin uh, has been a proponent of this. Uh, it's basically legislation designed to uh, uh, make the, play, the playing field level for Main Street in, in, in relation to internet competition, and uh, I, I strongly support it. Okay, we have room for more questions. Uh, this uh, Penny Finch, where are you? All right, Penny. We only have a rule here, only one question, so I'll ask the longer one. That's okay. Also, if we don't get any more, I'll ask the other one. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Penny Finch, Siegel Consulting. Your pension bill, <laughs> okay, this is City Club. Your pension bill only attracted 40 or so votes in Springfield. I assume that was in the House. In the House. Was it because it lacked revenue, or, and if so, will you put revenue on the table if you try again in the veto session? Thank you for your answer. Okay, so we went to Springfield late in the session in May. Uh, we secured support in the Senate. We got 36 votes, and we needed 30, so we had a supermajority. Uh, we went into the House and uh, passed the committee, uh, and then we didn't bring it to the floor because we didn't think we had the votes. And so we're going to be working over the summer and into the fall to meet with those uh, 
members of the House who are not in our plus column, uh, hopefully to secure their support, to explain the bill more fully, and to hopefully secure their support. And I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll have favorable action either in the veto session or more likely in a special session early in January. And this is very important to the county. I, I think there's been some speculation that, oh, you know, you're not in as bad shape as a city. Well, you know, we're moving, <laughs> we're moving very quickly in that direction. And unless we take action now and are proactive, we're going to be the same place the city is with some of its most um, uh, problematic pension funds, namely police and fire. So we're going to work hard on this over the next six months and hopefully secure passage in the House. Okay, we have one more question, and that'll be it. Uh, well, from the Illinois Department of Revenue, is this Brian? How do you pronounce your last name, Brian? Cleveland. Correct. <laughs> Tough. How confident are you that the county's pension reform plan will pass constitutional muster? What happens if it doesn't? So there were three different uh, measures that came before the, the legislature in Springfield. Senate Bill 1, which was the state pension bills. Um, two of the city's pension funds, municipal and labor. Uh, police and fire are the other two funds, and they're actually in worse financial shape than either municipal or labor, and our bill. And our bill basically put all the burden on ex our existing employee base, rather than retirees, at the request of our, our unions. And we believed that uh, our bill is more likely to be found constitutional than either the other two, um, either the state or the city one, for that reason, that it does not uh, basically touch the benefits that were promised to retirees uh, and, and uh, puts the burden entirely on those who are still in the workforce. And, you know, we, we said we were going to give ourselves a year and a half to try to figure out how we were going to fund this obligation. And I would point out that we got a pretty good record over the last four years of closing deficits, uh, one point one or two billion in deficits we've closed without raising property set taxes and rolling back the sales tax. So we're going to be as inventive as we possibly can. Um, and we hope that in the budget for fiscal year uh, 2016, uh, we'll have figured out the mechanism that we need to fund our pension obligations. So I'm, I'm confident that we can, we can do what needs to be done on our side. And we're going to be working, as I said, over the next six months to secure passage in the House. We've been assured by the governor that he'll sign our bill. So that's our plan. That's our path forward. Thank you. Now I'll ask my question. <laughs> it's everybody. What's the over and under? You like this? What's the over and under that those media people who are here obviously because they're interested in the budget will only ask budget questions of our speaker? I thought it'd be a lot better than that. How about a big round of applause? <laughs>